Hello, brothers and sisters. We have Marine Firefighting Awareness Training. Okay, objectives of this training are as follows. Increase knowledge of the Port of Wilmington, the maritime world, shipboard firefighting, ship types, ship terminology, ships, systems, and layouts. Basically, everything that's going to involve us at the Port of Wilmington, we want to become familiar with and have a general understanding. The SOP for response is taken from page five in the response hierarchy. For a vessel fire, engine two as the Marine Company and the Battalion Chief, that would be a ship fire that is in the river. Okay, the next one would be moored vessel fire. That is gonna be a ship that's tied to the dock at the Port of Wilmington. That's gonna be engine two and a box alarm. So uh, you could see the following companies. Those were taken from Fireboard. So uh, I reached out to them to see what was on the card for that, and that's what they have. Uh, as far as the B platoon is concerned, uh, myself and Chief Harris have discussed this, as well as others. That Engine 2 is responding to the Port of Wilmington as an engine company, and that is strictly based upon uh, our familiarity with the port, um, our training, uh, location, you know, known location of hydrants. Most of the guys at Engine 2 have taken the Virginia Marine Firefighting Training, so it would just be wise for us to be the first ones to make contact and enter the ship, and so on and so forth. Overview of the Port of Wilmington. Some general information. We're the number one American seaport uh, for fresh fruit and juice. We do an average of, I'm sorry, more than 400 vessels annually, uh, 308 acres of land. There's 10 berths, the auto berth, which is obviously out in the Delaware River, the floating berth, which is where Citrus Suco is located, the orange juice terminal, the fuel berth, which is Buckeye, formerly Magellan, and there are seven pier side berths. Facility manager is Alex Kane. That's his contact below. So he's in charge of all facilities. Question time. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. The hydrant system, there's red and yellow hydrants. Port hydrants are red. You can see their static pressure is 150 PSI. There's a valve wheel on top of the hydrant. So you don't need a hydrant wrench to open. They're supplied by the new pump house located between buildings E and F. I'll show you that on the map. It's a 1,500 gallon a minute pump. There's a static tank that's 200,000 gallons at the entrance to the port. Once the 200,000 gallons are used up, it'll draw from the city water main. The city hydrants are yellow. Uh, keep in mind they're at the end of the loop down at the port. The auto berth has its own independent system. Okay, so here's the map uh, you can see. On the left here is the port pump house. Okay, that is as soon as you enter the port between E and F. The old pump house, if uh, some of you may recall, was between A and C here, but it's been since demolished in 2019. The auto berth also has its own independent system. But keep in mind, it is not maintained. So, uh, the fire boat is another option. Um, drafting is another option. There's the port pump house when you enter the port between E and F. It's a new package unit. There's the static tank, 200,000 gallon static tank. Okay, just another visual. On the left is the pump and on the right is the rear of the pump house. Here's the Buckeye terminal foam house. So there's a lot going on here, test headers, discharges, intakes. Um, just my suggestion is to take a ride to the Port of Wilmington and familiarize yourself. This is inside the Buckeye foam house. Everything is well labeled, even on the inside. Okay, so that should eliminate any confusion. And here's the foam tank on the right. The auto berth pump house. It's also kind of its own independent system. 
the door was unlocked last time we were down there, but uh, there is a Knox box if you need to access it. It's a 4,000 gallon a minute pump. Okay, commercial ships. The organization of a ship based on personnel. There's a deck department and the engine department. The master in the deck department is an overall command of the ship. Chief mate, also called the first officer. He's in command of basically operations. So he would be your operations guy. You got the second mate, third mate, and the unlicensed crew. The engine department, the chief engineer, he's the command of all the engine and machinery spaces. First engineer would be kind of your operations guy in the engine room. He's the most knowledgeable. If we're on an incident or anything that involves a ship, that would be the go-to person as far as which valve do I turn or how much can I do with this? Or, you know, any, any information about the systems. The second engineer is usually in charge of fuel. The third engineer has different responsibilities. I did not list them. And then there's unlicensed crew. Typical vessel manning for the Port of Wilmington, the dull ships, the container ships, the larger ships that come to the port, usually between 16 and 25 crew. Wilmington tug on the right, top right of the picture, average of two crew. And the bottom is Vane Brothers tug and barge. That's about seven five personnel being on the tug itself and two actually living on the barge in that little white house right there that's sunken down okay they actually live inside there so if we get a fire a medical anything just this is just to give you an idea of how many people you would be looking for or dealing with okay it's not an exact but it's uh it's pretty close Okay, vessel types. These are types that are specific to the Port of Wilmington. Port of Wilmington. This isn't generic for every port. This is us. So this is what we need to focus on. Tankers. We have oil and bulk orange juice. Oil is going to come into Buckeye and bulk orange juice is going to come into the floating berth, which is um, citrus suco. Basically, they use pumps to offload cargo. Oil can carry multiple grades. Um, if they're partially loaded or empty, there can be a lot of vapors. Um, so a quick point, oil tankers use a system called inert gas. I have it written here. Uh, it basically puts in a low concentration of oxygen into the tank, so it, it, it will never um, explode. It will never get into that combustible range. Now, the barges that I showed earlier, like Vane Brothers coming to Buckeye, do not have that. It's, it's almost like a Coast Guard rule beater. Barges don't have to have it. So keep in mind that those tanks on the barge are definitely filled with uh, combustible vapors or explosive vapors. Uh, so just keep that in mind. The ships, probably not, but it's also good to be aware of it. Uh, there's a overview of a petroleum tanker, oil tanker. Lots of deck room. You know, the pipelines run down the center. There's a cross section of a tanker. You can see it has a double hull. Okay. That is to allow um, almost like a crash space if it gets hit or there's any damage done to the hull. It runs aground. You know, there's a double bottom down here. So it has a safety margin if it hits something that it's not polluting. That uh, that came into effect in 2015. All ships were mandated to have double hulls. Okay, tanker, orange juice. Citrusuco, that's one of the ships that comes to the Port of Wilmington. Plenty of deck space on that. Uh, cargo ships, container, row, row, and bulk. So here's a container ship, Dole Columbia. Uh, they basically carry trailers on board. The Dole Columbia can carry 1,023 refrigerated containers. Row, row, which means roll on, roll off. They use a large stern ramp or side ramp to just transport vehicles on and off. Basically a floating parking garage has a high freeboard, um, which is the distance from the water line to the top of the ship. So. Uh, high winds can really push the ship. 
Uh, it could be as many as 13 decks and 6,000 cars. Also has massive ventilation systems. Okay, so you can see these boxes on top of the, of the main deck of the ship. Those are to allow exchange of air for all the vehicles on board the ship. So keep that in mind when fighting a fire. Bulk ships. They are open cargo ships designed to hold coal, ash, salt, or grain. Uh, hazards include the oxygen deficiency in the cargo hold, spontaneous combustion, dust explosion, expanding when adding water. Tugboat, that's another vessel that's at the port. It's a vessel designed to move another vessel. Their primary job is to assist larger vessels in docking, i.e. Wilmington Tug. Their secondary job is to push or tow barges. Uh, some facts to know about them, they have a low freeboard and low distance between the water line and the, and the, uh, the top rail of the gunnel here, uh, which is like right there, that's, that's called the gunnel. Um, most do have fire pumps and hose lines crew between two and ten. I know Wilmington Tug, I said had two, but certain boats like this one could have at least six. Some could have up to ten. And the active tugs are always manned. Well, being, keep in mind, Wilmington Tug has some inactive tugs that are always tied to the dock. Nobody's on those tugs. Uh, the lights might be on because it could be hooked to shore power, but just keep that in mind if we go down there. A barge. It's a box-shaped, flat-deck, non-powered vessel. Um, Port of Wilmington, we have the fuel tank barge. At Mag I put Magellan, Buckeye Terminal. And it says, appear to be the same as a ship, but it will not have the same type of fire protection systems. So no fire pumps. And like I said, the inert gas system is a big deal. ITB, which is an integrated tug and barge. This is the OSG Horizon. We also have the OSG Vision. You can actually see they're uh, registered in Wilmington, Delaware, as most ships are. But these, this will dock occasionally at the port, as well as the OSG Vision. Um, they are as big as a ship, and they're a tug and barge that's connected by pins on the inside. This inside part of the barge is called a notch. So the tug slides in and has pins that um, mechanically move out to lock it in. It's difficult to get from the tug to the barge and vice versa if we have a fire or a medical. So keep that in mind. If we were at the port, we'd have to board the barge and climb down a ladder to get to the tug. Um, so we'd be up here on the deck on the, the barge and usually there's a ladder that runs down to the, the tug. Uh, so that could be a difficult operation. Quick case history. Um, the SS Pan Georgia, July 1953, had a fire at the Port of Wilmington. Okay, it was the steam tanker Pan Georgia, built in 1945. On July 23rd, 1953, it was moored at the Port of Wilmington. Uh, it was Sicko Terminal, which is now um, Buckeye. It says about 2200 shortly after standby orders, ballast tank. Ballasting operations caused the explosion of vapors from the number five wing tank. Vapors diffused outward and outboard, outward and downward, and were ignited by a source of ignition in a way of the tugs alongside. Um, the fire involved the tanker, both tugs, and the pier. Five crew members from the Denine, J. H. Denine, two crew members from the Watico, and one crew member from the Pan Georgia lost their lives as a result of the disaster. So there was eight fatalities in this fire in the Port of Wilmington in 1953. Okay, we're gonna get into terminology. Front of the ship is the bow. The right side is the starboard side. The area where the crew lives is called the house or crew's quarters, or you could call it accommodation spaces. The bridge is the top level of those spaces where the ship is commanded, the steering systems, the chart room, all your um, 
fire alarm systems are located on the bridge. The stern is the back. Engine room is down below. Uh, basically, if you look for the ship for the exhaust stacks and follow them straight down, that usually gives you an idea of where the engine room is located. You can see water discharging on the port side as well. That means one of the engine room pumps is running. Cargo holds. And the port side is the left side. Hull markings and terminology. This is just a basic idea to get you aware of draft marks. So top left here, we have a load lines. You'll see that on the side of the ship. That just tells um, the crew and the basically insurance company where the ship can legally be allowed to load based on the type of body of water they're in. So quickly, TF is tropical fresh, S is summer, WNA is winter North Atlantic. So based on the body of water, the density of the ocean is going to change so they can load at different depths. Just so you know what it is. Uh, this circle with an X to it is a bow thruster. So below the water line would be a bow thruster. This mark indicates a bulbous bow. So the protrusion on the bow here is indicated by this up here. So if there was a tug crossing, he could see that and not to know, don't cut right in front of the ship. Okay, down below is here and to the right is what is important. These are called draft marks. And this is something that we would utilize during a ship fire. And uh, on this picture, they're marked on the stern and on the bow. So we would keep an idea of where the marks are when we get to the ship in a fire. And then we would try and track them throughout the incident to see how much water we're putting on the ship and if it's causing um, any weight to be added to the vessel, which it certainly will. So on the right here, you can see 24 feet, 26 feet. So if the ship starts going down, we know we're adding a certain quantity of water. Okay, layout of the vessel. You have the bridge, or called the pilot house or wheelhouse, where the navigation, steering, and propulsion control are the weather station charts, communications, like I said earlier, smoke detection and fire alarm panels, the watertight door controls, and basically serves, serves as the ship's command center. Here's a picture of the bridge. This is a very simplistic bridge. Um, some can be more complex. Engine control room, it's another space. A lot going on here, switches, controls, computer monitoring, throttles, communications. A lot of times the systems on the bridge like fire alarm and such are mirrored down here as well as watertight doors. The engine control room it controls the engine operations. Okay, it inclu includes suppression, ventilation, and steering systems. It's normally staffed like I said, they're usually a backup of the bridge, and it's usually an isolated space in the engine room that would have a separate escape route. So keep in mind, if there's a fire, there could be someone that is still in there um, that didn't get out, but thankfully most should have a separate escape route. Not saying they do, though. The engine control room. Here's an electrical board. Fire control room. fire pump, engine room. This is the fire pump on the motor vessel Delaware responder. As you can see, it's not labeled or marked except on the controller. Uh, there is a small label down here, but nothing bright and bold for firefighters. That's more for ship's crew. Accommodation, accommodation spaces, that's where the crew lives and sleeps. Okay, just like any house or hotel, galley, food, recreation, laundry, and cruise quarters. Here's an example of cruise quarters. This is on the Delaware Responder. This is the chief engineer's room. Storage and auxiliary spaces. They include paint lockers, CO2 room, battery rooms, and steering gear rooms. Here's an example of steering room. This is on the Delaware Responder. Cargo spaces, they usually run the full length of the vessel. They could be up to 13 stories deep. They hold liquid or dry cargo, depending on the type of ship. And what are some examples of cargo here in Wilmington? 
We actually already covered them. Fuel, orange juice, cars, uh, fly ash or coke, salt, grain. Vessel hazards and safety at pier. Okay, here's some considerations. You need to be aware of clearance on the pier, both vertically and horizontally. There's a lot of obstructions. The stability of the pier, you can see the pier collapse here in 2020 in Seattle, Washington. The Port of Wilmington, I don't know how well the pier is maintained, so just keep that in mind when you start loading up with fire trucks. Pier construction, that goes along with stability. Workers evacuating, people will be running off the ship. The uh, longshoremen will be around, just be mindful of that. And then the radiant heat from the vessel because it is a steel structure. Okay, vessel um, at the pier, safety. Uh, there's a safety zone you need to keep. You can need to watch out for parting lines. So in the picture, you can see the line starting to fray. You can see these lines under strain here on the deck. And there's a snapback zone that you need to keep in mind. So when you park a, a fire truck, on the pier and it's tied off to the ship and then it's tied off to the pier and it snaps it's coming straight back and on the right here you can see there's a turn in direction or change in direction and it's going to snap um, in the red zone so just keep that in mind when you park on the pier not to park in the snack zone of ships okay here's a picture of the double responder there's slack lines are there any concerns well, yes and no. Yes, that the vessel could move while, while it's at the berth. And no, because that line probably isn't going to snap back because it's allowing for shipment. Now, these have tension. Are there any concerns? Yes, these lines are under a lot of tension. If they snap back, it's going to travel in that straight line. So if we parked behind this bollard uh, here on the pier, that line is coming straight for the truck. So we're going to try and avoid those areas. Also, working on the deck, are these guys in the hazard zone? Well, yeah, it looks like they are. This line doesn't look like it's under a lot of strain, but still, if you can operate clear of that, that would be a wise decision. So vessel access, there's two means, the accommodation ladder, or called the gangway, or the pilot's ladder. One thing for emergency egress um, on the river side of the vessel, um, you can use the gangway. You can lower it. There's a gangway on both sides of the ship. You can lower it down to the water level. So uh, Fireboat 7 or another fire company or the Coast Guard standing by, they could grab us off the ladder if we had to evacuate. Also, um, WFD aerial ladder positioned either near the bow or stern or both with someone at the turntable ready to operate uh, to drop it down to the ship if we need to evacuate. Here's pictures on the right. It's gonna be the pilot's ladder. You can see in, com in conjunction with the gangway and on the left is the gangway. That could be set up for an emergency egress. Okay, so it's like at deck level of one of the rescue boats. Here's a setup of emergency egress with a ladder truck positioned near the bow of the vessel. Vessel safety information. Okay, some important things for you to know. The edge of the vessel uh, for smoke condition or night ops, you don't want to fall off the side of the ship. So just be mindful that you know where the edge of the ship is. Uh, be aware of the changing tides, the mooring lines, you know, picking up strain. Wind, wind conditions like those row rows, it could be pushed away from the pier. We need to be mindful of that as we're boarding the ship. Deck hazards include slip, fall, uh, a lot of trip hazards, pipes, lines, a lot of things you need to be aware of. Uh, the flammable liquids and gases, good idea to bring a meter with you on the ship. Uh, Access egress routes inside the vessel. See next slide, so let's go to that. So you need to be aware on the left, hatch is left open in the edge room there. You could drop down in the bilge. And on the right, um, there's a long um, corridor or passageway. 
it's easy to become disoriented. When you're down in the middle, uh, kind of looks the same. So which way is forward or aft? You know, which way was out? What are tight doors? Um, here's here's an automatic closing. Uh, you could do it manually, or there could be a remote operation on the bridge. You don't want to get trapped, so somebody needs to be in command of those. Engine room, you need to be aware of rotating, moving equipment, high voltage, starting machinery. Sometimes it automatically starts up, you know, air pressure, steam pressure, all sorts of machinery. Um, and there's a lot of hazmat in the engine room as well. There's an example on a steamship. On the left, you got a 900 PSI boiler. And on the right, here's your walkway between the boiler. There's high temp, uh, there's high pressure and there's high temp fuel oil. Uh, all that piping's hot. So as you're crawling along there on the line, going down to this auxiliary machinery space, you have a lot of hazards that you're passing by. You could get burnt. So you just need to be mindful of that. Additional safety aboard the vessel, common sense, use all your senses, stay aware. Expect the trip hazards, make that mental note of your path taken through the vessel. Utilize the crew members as guides, they know the ship better than we do. When you're using a ladder well, face the ladder when descending. Uh, the tread depth on these ladder wells is not much, and we're not used to climbing up and down these, so the safest way to go down is to face the ladder. Uh, beware of the flashing lights or warning signals. Um, if somebody rings off a abandoned ship um, and, and we're not sure what it is, make sure you verify. Uh, the, for the chief officers, monitor the vessel's draft and trim. We already covered that with those numbers on the side of the ship. And keep in mind a ship fire has, in a compartment has six sides. Top, bottom, and all four sides. So another thing, slide or shuffle your feet uh, or crawl and reduce visibility. Um, there's a combing on the deck. It's a little plating along a walkway that you would hit with your feet before you step off an edge. And that's why I say slide or shuffle your feet. So you'll hit that combing. Um, so you'll know you're about to go over a rail. Okay, the, the handrails in engine room spaces are not the best and they're most, mostly designed for the engineering staff. So there could be a gap in the rail that if you're crawling, you could crawl right over it. If you're walking, if you're shuffling your feet, you'll hit that combing on the deck. Also, if you're crawling, use your hands to feel for that combing. Uh, assume all tanks, cargo spaces, paint, everything else is oxygen deficient. Use your air monitoring and never stand on the cargo. Common sense. Like I said earlier, face the ladder when descending. Um, like I said, the tread depth is not great. These ladders are steep. If you go down face first, you're most likely to slip or trip over multiple hose lines. There's oil on these stairwells, ladder wells. Uh, be mindful of the trip hazards on deck. Okay, communications. Talk to, are we gonna utilize that? Ships radio, use a runner, sound powered phone. These are all options. Radios, just like parking garages and basements, high rises, we're going to lose TAC A. So, this is something we need to utilize and train on. Talk to would be good. Uh, the ship's radios, sometimes they're good, and they we could either borrow them or have a crew member with us. Uh, a runner is an option, somebody running back and forth. Not literally running, but you get the point. Um, sound powered phone, they're inside the ship. They don't require any electric to use. Uh, that's something good to familiarize yourself with. It's like in the old movies, it's just a hand crank and it rings another phone and you select on the phone who you wanna call. So if I was in the engine room, I could call the bridge from the engine room without power. So if our radio, radio's lost contact, the bridge we could make uh, communications with via the sound powered phone. Fire suppression systems on board a ship. CO2, they're total flooding systems. They fill the entire space. Uh, the activation cabinet is located outside the space. That's where you pull the system to activate it. 
the dampers and the vents must be closed for it to be effective. And the captain would make sure he had accountability. If we're on the scene and they decide to pull it, we need to get accountability of our people as well. There's a 30 second delay uh, to allow for people to evacuate the space, but you wanna have everybody accounted for because as soon as you discharge that, if you're not on air, uh, you're gonna be trapped because they're gonna lock you in there or it's gonna be, um, the oxygen's gonna be displaced and you won't survive. So uh, the master has to give permission to discharge. So permission needs to be requested. Sprinkler systems, uh, there's usually a dedicated sprinkler pump in the engine room. They could be for cargo holds. They could be for accommodation spaces. You need to verify on the specific ship that you're on. The fire main and standpipe system, uh, Fire main is the vessel's standpipe system. They should usually have two fire pumps, a main and a backup. Here's some pictures of the fire main and standpipe system. Most ships have inch and three, inch and, um, sorry, inch and a half. On the right, you see the SS right, which was docked in Philadelphia, now it's in Norfolk, but has a two and a half on deck. Here's the international shore connection. This is our way of connecting to the quote unquote standpipe system. This is our FDC for the ship. So you can see here in this picture, you got the three inch coming in, the inline pressure gauge and the international shore connection. So the purpose is to supply the vessel standpipe system. Um, that will allow us to use their hose lines. Okay, we can use them for boundary cooling or exterior operations we would not use them for an IDLH environment. We would use our own hose lines and water supply. But keep in mind, they're good. They're a good resource for boundary cooling. Um, the International Shore Connection is a standard size flange that allows us to connect to the fire main, okay? It's our responsibility to have the correct thread. Once the flanges are bolted together, the engine can supply the fire main of the ship. And the parts are the four bolts, the gasket, and the flange, and also the inline pressure. Uh, other things to remember, do not exceed the design pressure of the system. The rating is 150 PSI. Before supplying, just coordinate with the vessel's engineers and make sure all the drains and valves are closed. We have two international shore connections. One has a male thread on the end, one has a female swivel they are located on fireboat seven there's also one at the port at the uh, auto birth pump house but it's incomplete they know about it whether it's going to be fixed or not uh, we'll uh, soon find out here's a picture of a ship on the left that's a row row at the port at the auto birth uh, that box is where the isc is and actually on the back side there's a tube that has the fire plan in it so that there's a gangway that folds down this platform so that's usually what you'll find you'll come up the gangway to the ship and there will be the international shore connection and the fire plan so the stuff we need it's in a red box can't miss it and here's the door on the auto berth Here's a little regulation description about it. This is what it looks like. So basically it allows our system to connect to a ship from anywhere in the world that's not gonna have Wilmington thread, let alone US national hose thread, national pipe thread. It's not gonna have any of that. Um, it could be coming from China, but it's gonna have this standard four bolt flange that we can match ours to theirs, fold them together, and it'll allow us to supply the ship. The fire control plan, okay, there's different vessel plans. The fire control plan, general arrangement of the vessel with locations and types of fire and safety equipment. It'll assist us in developing an incident action plan. We can utilize it with the captain or the chief mate and determine a route of access to the suspected fire area, okay? Keep in mind, it might be in different measurement units on a foreign ship, usually located in three locations. One permanently mounted, one's like in a picture frame in the ship. That's the permanent 
location. And there's also two stored in watertight containers that are labeled. Here's an example of the fire plan, also called the safety plan of the Delaware responder. Another plan, uh, an additional plans are the stowage plan, location of each item on the ship, the cargo manifest, it documents all the cargo that's carried, and there's an SDS for hazmat. Also, there's a crew list, immigration info, a station bill that assigns each crew member a particular location for emergencies, like abandoned ship, fire and emergency, man overboard, and the muster list. That's what we're concerned with. The muster list is important. Um, that contains the names of the crew members. So we might secure that from the captain to account for everybody on the ship. quick video of the Centaurus, which I'll skip through. Oh, here it is. Okay, I can't get this to play for some reason. So feel free to go to YouTube and look up Centaurus Shipfire. Disregard. We got it to play. Okay, the motor vessel Centaurus, 557-foot cargo vessel, 1989, February, fire in the city of Wilmington at the port. There's a picture of it. Okay, suffered an engine room fire while docked at the port of Wilmington in 1989. The crew did not activate the CO2 system. The fire main did not have standard threads and the firefighters were unable to connect to it. They were unaware of the international shore connection. Okay, so that's a lesson learned. We, we know about it now. Um, we just need to familiarize ourselves. The access route was difficult. Firefighters became low on air. Uh, additional firefighters entered the engine room to assist those who were running low and were attempting to return to the main deck. Everybody made it out safe. Um, the fire service, our guys activated the CO2 system, but the entire system didn't discharge and engine room ventilation was not fully secured, so it was ineffective. The 43,000 43, gallon fuel oil service tank in the engine room um, expanded and the 
The fuel was flowing onto the main deck, causing pollution into the river. Paint was flaking off the ship, um, blocked the drains on the ship. The ship started to list. Uh, then they cleared them and, and pumped off the water. Um, Coast Guard was familiar with the vessel's fire control plan. Um, after that, once they got that, they were able to identify an access point to start flowing foam into the engine room. They took 10,000 gallons of foam to extinguish the fire. Problems associated with the fire, inability to communicate with the crew. Uh, obviously, there was a language barrier, lack, lack of knowledge of the vessel systems and arrangement. Uh, that's the goal of this training, so we have a better awareness. Um, lack of knowledge of the fire control plan. We also know where that is now, okay? Um, and we'll use the ship's crew to assist us with uh, kind of looking at it. It's difficult to look at for the first time when you're at the incident, you know, but if you have a ship's crew member, it'll accelerate uh, that knowledge. Logistics of managing large amounts of foam, okay? Um, recharging lights, batteries, radios, okay? And the dewatering uh, was an issue and the runoff blue. Incident response. Okay, size up, very important. What type of ship are we dealing with? Is it light or loaded? Does it have product on board or not? Okay, that'll change the freeboard of the vessel. The trim and stability, the mooring lines, their exposure, the condition of the hull, and what do we have showing when we arrive? And location, where is it located at the port? Okay, here's a size up exercise. Obviously, it's not at the Port of Wilmington, but um, well, I'll give you a brief uh, history of this fire while you think about size up. Okay, 2006, 60 miles southeast of Yemen. This was the Hyundai, Hyundai, Hyundai Fortune. Uh, there was an unknown explosion below deck aft of the accommodation spaces. It caused 60 to 90 containers to fall into the ocean. Uh, the explosion resulted in a fire that spread throughout the stern of the ship. There was a secondary explosion that occurred in seven containers that contained fireworks. After all onboard efforts to contain the fire failed, the 27 crew members decided to abandon ship and they were rescued by the Dutch Navy, which happened to be in the area. The firefighting tugs extinguished the fire two days later. The estimated loss was 800 million and the ship was eventually towed to Omen. The cause of the fire was believed to be in a container loaded with petroleum-based cleaners. And also a side note, there was a safety data sheet uh, was never given to the ship's crew. And that was in order to negate the special hazmat handling fees of those cleaning uh, agents. Okay, quick size up. Where is the fire located? Basically, what area of the ship? Something to think about. Okay, June of 2020 in Jacksonville, Florida. The motor vessel Hal Scheiman. Uh, there was a car fire on deck eight. There was a 28 minute delay in notification to the fire department. The ship utilized the VHF, VHF radio to notify the Coast Guard, but they were on the wrong channel, so it never got through. But another vessel heard that and transferred the information to the Coast Guard. The initial 911 call did not come from the ship. It came from a person on the pier that noticed the smoke. Um, the fire alarm system on the ship was offline because they were loading vehicles. I guess they secure it during that process. Um, and it... It has to manually be put online or it, after so many hours, it automatically comes back online. But that was not on at the time of the fire. The crew activated the CO2 system um, after fire department arrival on deck seven and eight. Then the fire department tried to um, enter and extinguish the remaining fire with the extension. Um, but there was also fire and extension on deck nine, which I'm not sure if they were aware of or not. 
there was no vertical fire blocks in the uh, on the deck of the ship. So when Jacksonville accessed the upper decks, there was a backdraft, which injured nine firefighters. Um, the cause of the fire was due to an improperly disconnected car battery. And the losses were estimated at $40 million. Uh, one thing to note, with new cars, they're a lot better with disconnecting connecting the batteries. But with used or wrecked cars, which we have at the Port of Wilmington at the auto berth, quite often, um, sometimes it's hard to access those batteries with a wrecked car. So sometimes they're not properly disconnected or sometimes they're just missed. So that's something to be mindful of. July 2020, the USS Bonhomme Richard, uh, they had a fire in the lower vehicle deck of this. Uh, it's an amphibious assault ship. The fire took four days to extinguish and injured 63 people, lost total $3.2 billion. Uh, it was docked in San Diego, California. Okay, there was late notification uh, from the ship's crew to uh, the Navy Fire Department on base and San Diego as well. Uh, there was radio issues between all three parties. Um, the federal fire department got there and connected to what they thought was a water supply on the dock, but it ended up being a potable water line that supplies drinking water. It was only 400 gallons a minute, so they didn't have sufficient water to begin with. Uh, there was no hydrants on the pier. Um, the federal fire department did not have the appropriate connection to connect to the ship's system. So they couldn't use that. Um, and um, there was a delay in notifying San Diego as well. And when they got there, San Diego Fire Department, they were told to stage by federal fire. Um, so there's a timeline which I have outlined um, on the next slide. But basically, uh, 0100. There was smoke condition on the lower vehicle deck. 0823 attempts were made to access the deck. 0826 federal fire was dispatched. 0900 San Diego arrives and secures the first water supply. Um, 0951 San Diego was the first to flow water on the fire. 1035 San Diego advises command that the upper vehicle deck is about to explode. Two minutes later, the ship's evacuated, and 13 minutes later, the explosion occurs. After that, that was the end of any successful attempt to fight the fire offensively. Here's just a picture prior to them evacuating the ship. Okay, here's the timeline that I just kind of went through, but you can see the key points I have highlighted. Zero 08, they noticed the lower V deck was foggy. Zero 0826, Fed fire dispatched. And you can follow along accordingly. I'll give you a minute to read it over. Here's a picture of them accessing the vessel. You can see all the lines they had running up that ramp. The ramp was nice for access though with those lines. Quick layout of the ship. Okay, it was in the lower V or the lower vehicle deck. You can see. This is after the ship was evacuated. They had um, private contract, basically fireboat tugs come in. And this YouTube channel, What's Going On With Shipping, is a good resource. This is where I got a lot of my information on this one. Basically goes over the whole fire and, like he says in the second part, analysis, commentary, and fireboats. Okay, so attack strategy situations. This is not set in stone, but it gives us a guideline as to when we should conduct an offensive attack or a defensive attack. 
um, for an offensive, if there's crew on board, life-threatening situation, okay, if there's a rescue, if the fire appears to be quote-unquote manageable, uh, the fire suppression has been used, um, and an attack is necessary to protect cargo, or an offensive attack can confine the fire to a part of the vessel. That would be the times we use an offensive. Defensive, limited availability of extinguishing agents, okay? Uh, inability to gain access to the seat of the fire, large amounts of heat, inability to control the fire, explosion, vessel instability, or insufficient resources. Here's a tactical worksheet that we have that will be made available. Kind of a strategy is to establish communications with the ship's captain. Okay, we wanna know all this information in here, the location, the type of incident. Uh, does he have accountability of the crew? Uh, is there any hazmat or cargo on board? What's their strategies and plans for managing the incident? Because more than likely they're gonna be trying to do something to fight the fire, it's their ship. Or they could just abandon altogether, but we need to know that. And the status of the systems. CO2 has it been activated, not activated, is it functioning? We wanna establish a water supply. Here's our considerations. The port hydrants, city hydrants, fire boat, or drafting. Okay, we need to bring all our equipment on board. And it's always not, it's not always easy, okay? The gangway can hold a certain amount of weight uh, we might have to use ship's cranes. We might have to use a messenger line to pull the hose line on board. The squad can set up um, a rigging with an equipment bag to transfer equipment onto the ship. Or we can utilize manpower up the gangway, basically carrying equipment. Here's an idea of an initial equipment list. Okay, uh, this is just a general guideline. And it's, like I said, it's only a guideline, but it's helpful to get us started. So water supply, that, that's what takes up most of the time, I feel like. Um, you would start, general arrangement is three, three-inch lines from the engine to the ship's weather deck. Um, you can see in this picture, there's loops placed in these lines, okay? Uh, that allows for the ship's movement up and down and on and off the dock as the wind pushes it. So in this picture, the engine is supplied with the fire boat. But like I said, you can also use the port hydrants. Another close-up picture. Here's the fire boat water supply for this training evolution. After the three-inch lines come up, they go to a manifold. Okay, then to a five inch supply. On the right, you can see the three three inch lines coming up the side of the ship. Here's another example. This is the outboard side. This is connected to a fire boat coming into this manifold or water thief. Water thief. Then going down the deck, the five inch line hooks to another manifold. And from there, you're running three inch lines. It, Three inch line goes to a gated Y and then to your hand lines. Or in this case, there's a um, master stream there. If you follow this link or go to my YouTube page, you will see a water supply setup video. Okay, running lines to the fire. It's very difficult down these ladder wells and they become congested very quickly. Just some pictures of the obstacles that we'll have to overcome. Okay, the Virginia model or the training class that we take in Virginia at the seminar is to run two lines when entering the space, one for water, one for foam. In this case, the truck company assists with the advancement. It takes everybody involved to move these lines. When advancing down a ladder well, only feed what is needed and communicate whether you need more or less. You don't want a whole bunch of hose line at the bottom of the ladder well. It will cause confusion and it's basically your exit plan. You want people at pinch points, kind of just like a house fire. And you want to run the water line first, followed by the foam line. So 
So the water line will go down a flight of stairs or a ladder well, reach the bottom, communicate for the phone line to follow, okay? You want to keep the line on the deck. You don't want to well stretch. Like I said, your hose line is your escape plan. Try to keep it oriented to how many decks you are ascending or descending. Okay, it's more manpower intensive. The hose line that will run will be the inch and three quarter. We won't use the two and a half. So you need to bring it off the engine company. The 400 foot could be used as a ship line. It comes off the rear so we can break it at two and two. And uh, we could have 200, two 200 foot lines off the bat going onto the ship. Here's just a visual of an engine room. And one thing I want to touch on, remember I said the combing in the engine room, you can see here in the red, I'm highlighting it, but it's, it's painted white along this green deck. If you're shuffling your feet along the deck, um, you'll, you'll hit that combing. Okay. See the handrail is not the best. If you're crawling, you could go through it. So if you're sliding your hands, if you're crawling, you'll hit it too, but just keep that in mind. Very important. Uh, crew rotation is important. Uh, you want to manage your air. Uh, you want to keep the ladder wells clear. Always keep them clear because people are trying to exit the space. And somebody managing the air as like an air management officer would be good just to keep track of who's in the space and how much they have. Dewatering, that's very important. The Centaurus, we had that issue. So much water on the ship, they end up cutting a hole in the side to drain it out. Uh, we need to be aware of how much water we're putting on. It'll impact the stability and um, also our safety. So here's an example, one two and a half inch line flowing 250 GPM can place over 30 tons of water on board in 30 minutes. So that's a lot of water, a lot of weight too, to change the dynamics of the ship. So incident command should develop a dewatering plan. Okay, here's some examples. Utilize the onboard vessel systems. Uh, utilize portable pumps. There's some located at station seven. There's some on fireboat seven. Um, you would do in coordination with the ship's crew and the Coast Guard and DENREC due to contamination. Ship in New York in the 40s. And there was a fire on board and they capsized it. So you just need to be mindful of how much water you put on a ship. It was actually, if I remember right, it was low tide, it was um, low tide and the ship actually sat on the bottom and it kind of fell over. Here it is. It's the, the uh, SS Normandy. Okay, the tide, capsized by the tides. Okay, some additional considerations. Okay, utilize the marine units as a river side safety or rescue boat and consider booming the ship with an oil boom, both as an object to grab a firefighter in the water that they can grab onto or for pollution control. Okay, conclusion. Uh, shipboard firefighting is firefighting is labor intensive and time consuming. Our training and our pre plan will be our asset to handle these emergencies and utilize all your resources. Um, the Coast Guard, the Tri State MERT, Chief Holsenbeck, and Doug Dillon are part of that. There's the phone number to contact them. The ship's agents, the port officials, the ship's crew. Thank you for your time, and I hope you learned something.